do it. Cool. Hi. Hello. Hello, tiny people on the internet. Um, yeah, welcome to, this is going to be a, a bit of an introduction to modular um, masterclass, course, workshop, uh, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, uh, I've been doing these for a quite a number of years now. I run a, a little shop in Bristol called Elevator Sound. It's the, uh, the last remaining uh, specialist synth shop in England. So... Yeah, tiny little shop full of this sort of stuff, loads of desktop synths and things. Um, and yeah, a lot of what I do there is helping people design and build systems and showing people how it all works. People come into the shop, do little demos and try out lots of different different modules. So yeah, we're going to have a little look at that today. Um, does anyone have any experience with modular stuff? Cool, couple hands up. Oh yeah, I see, th I see the synth cables. Um, there we go, see? Um, <laughs> yeah, they're good. Good company synth cables. They make good cables. Um, yeah, so cool. For for anyone who doesn't, I'll do a little brief bit of history. Um, I'll start at the start. I'm glad I didn't plan a presentation, um, so I'm just going to talk about it. Um, and yeah, if this will all go up online afterwards and get captioned and everything, so you can go and kind of Google and, and do your own research and stuff. But uh, yeah. So modular effectively means that you can take it apart and replace bits of it um, and suit it more to your needs. So Lego is modular, IKEA furniture is modular, and synths can be modular. It's uh, kind of the oldest way of, of building a synth. If you go back to like, you know, the 50s and 60s when, you know, you couldn't build something that was nice and small and convenient, it had to be like the size of a, you know, a box like an enormous crate just for one to get one sound out of it. So you'd have to then build all the parts individually and assemble them into one big thing. But similarly to, you know, computers from the 60s, it would be like the size of this whole wall for kind of one synth. Fast forward to the 90s. Um, obviously, keyboard synths have happened. Everything's got a bit smaller. Um, and this uh, lovely German guy called Dieter Dopfer started making... Um, modules but in this kind of smaller size um, and this is known to this day as Eurorack modular which is uh, like a specific format so back in the 60s all the companies were making stuff to different standards so they'd have different power they'd be different sizes if you tried to fit them all in the same case or you tried to plug them all in together you'd probably blow one of them up and it would be like 20 grand to replace it and that's like 20 grand back then money so that's like 200 grand or something now the good thing is nowadays, um, since Dopfa kind of invented the Euro rack standards, it means that all of these modules that you can see in the case here, they're all the same height. So they're 3U, which is like standard rack height that you find in like 19 inch rack stuff. Um, they all use the same width measurements, um, which is called HP. Uh, it stands for horizontal pitch. Um, if you look it up online, there's a really fun like 500 page thread of just people coming up with like stupid variants on it. Hippo points is my personal favorite one. Um, so that's how you kind of measure the width. And then they all run on the same power. So we can have, you know, modules here from Belgium, from America, from Germany, from where's the also American, Italian, uh, English, like all in the same case. And they're all going to be completely fine. And you can plug them all into each other in whatever way you want. And you're pretty much never going to break it by plugging anything in wrong. So you can just kind of go mad with the patch cables and see what happens. Um, but yeah, since the 90s, is there's been a, there's been a, a fair there's been a fair boom in the last maybe like 10, 15 years or so. Um, you know, to the point where we can run a, a whole shop based off of this um, and send stuff all over the world all the time, which is really nice. And yeah, the difference between I guess like a modular synth and like buying a pre-built desktop synth is that. So this is effectively like a build-your-own-instrument kit. You can do whatever you want with it. If you want to build a synth, you know, this is a kind of two-voice synth with a bunch of effects in it. Um, this little one here. This sweet little baby case is just a sampler. Um, it will also run off a battery pack, which is quite handy. Um, so yeah, you can kind of make anything you want out of it. And you're not limited by the routing choices that 
you know, you're given. So if you want to use the keyboard to control the pitch, you can. But if you want to use something else to control the pitch, then you can use literally anything else that's on here. Um, it might not sound good, but that's the point sometimes. <laughs> um, I'll also pass around this little guy, um, just so everyone has an idea of, if you haven't seen a module, of what they look like and what they consist of. Um, so yeah, it's a front panel, a circuit board, and a power cable. Uh, they're all powered individually, so we can swap them out. Um, and they have the the way that they do power is kind of specific, but there's a little cable with a red stripe on it. You have to plug it in a certain way. There's loads of much better resources for explaining it than I can right now. Um, and also, it's kind of dry, so we don't need to go into that straight away. But uh, you can look that up in your own time because it's a uh, yeah, fairly fairly self-explanatory, and also these days, pretty much you know, very very difficult to damage a module by plugging it in wrong. A lot of them have kind of protection because of people like me who've plugged them in wrong and had to phone someone up and be like, "I'm really sorry, I didn't read the board before I plugged it in. Can you send me a new one?" <laughs> so yeah, that's a very brief history of um, of modular synths, I guess. Um, but yeah, they're used uh, for all sorts of things. Nowadays, people use them for performance, for composition, for you know production in the studio, for you know live band stuff, for you know scoring, all sorts. Um, because it's pretty much a like limitless format as to what you can do. Um, you also get modules that do video, which is good fun. Um, have no idea how that works. Um, faster than this. This is that's as much as I know. I think it's a million times faster than this. But yeah, outside of that, no real idea. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, also, yeah, shout out to this module. This is the Mini Drive by Music Thing Modular, who are a London based DIY company. And they make really handy DIY modules that you can build yourself, um, which are pretty easy. Let's, um, I'm just going to screw this one back in, otherwise, it's going to fall out and I'm going to forget about it. I should have just put like a nice drone on in the background or something, really. Mm. Uh, talk amongst yourselves. So yeah, that's the other thing. You know, these cases. Oh yeah, last thing, cases. Of course, we talk about the modules. Can't forget the most important part. They need a little house to live in. Um, so the cases, like I mentioned, um, because everything's measured in HP horizontal pitch. Uh, the cases are like you know standardized lengths. This is 104 HP. And you can fit the 104 HP's worth of modules in there. Uh, it's got a little power input. And that feeds power onto a little board in the back, which then drives all of the modules. Um, and you just put it in. It's got these handy little kind of screw rails that you just screw into. And they're good. You know, they're good. And they will sit there happily until you decide to take them out one day. Uh, oh, yeah, good question. This one is 4 HP. Um, I've been around these modules for uh, like nearly 10 years. I still often can't tell by eye. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that one was for, I think the, the smallest that you find most standard modules in are 2 HP, um, which is, so you go back to the baby case. This little silver one at the end is 2 HP. Um, any smaller than this and you basically can't fit a jack socket on it, so it's kind of useless. Um, also, if you're really interested, I think it works out about 0 0.568 centimeters per HP. Don't quote me on that, though. <laughs> That's probably wrong. Um, yeah, cool. So let's get into making some sounds, because um, it's really good at that. So uh, you may have noticed um, the big piles of cables about... Um, so for anyone unfamiliar, uh, we'll see there's no like MIDI input on this. Um, there's no kind of USBs on this. It's all these tiny little sockets. And the way that uh, modular communicates with itself is using voltage, just pure electricity. Um, it's very, um, yeah, pretty rudimentary um, way of doing it. It hasn't changed over the years, really. Um, which means one of the downsides, or 
positives, depending on how you look at it, is that each cable can only carry one signal at a time, one value, one number. So all of the connections you make have to be done on the front, and you can kind of see everything that's going on. Um, it does get to a point where it becomes like a big noodly mess, um, and you have to follow it, follow the cables along to see what's going on. But it means that it's very visual, um, means that it's very nice for kind of performance and things. So, sound. Let's make a noise, and then we can go from there. Do -do -do. Turn this down a bit. Oh. Good, it works. Um, so yeah, I think what I'll probably go through first is just how to build like a basic monophonic synth voice. So a synth voice that plays kind of one note at a time. Uh, polyphony is a bit of a fun one to do in modular. There's some modules that specifically are designed for building chords, um, but a lot of them are just kind of, yeah, one note at a time. Um, if you want to get two notes, you need two oscillators and so on and so forth. So, um, does anyone, can, can anyone shout out the, the things that go into a kind of synth voice? Yes. Oscillator, one of those. Pitch? Part of the oscillator, vital, vital part of the, the system, but part of the oscillator, technically. Filter, yeah. Amplifier, yeah. VCA, yeah. Technical name for the amplifier. And then the envelope. The envelope was the last one. It's the little, the little one that helps us sh shape things. So, yeah, I'm going to have a look at kind of putting these together um, using all the things in this case. So, like I mentioned, this is this case is kind of two synth voices and a bunch of effects and sequences and things. It's the case I use for pretty much everything I do. Um, so, yeah, we'll have a little look at that. So, let's take our oscillator. Um, it's this one here. It's the Duranalog Generate 3. It's a nice um, analog oscillator, part of the name. Um, and easily, first thing to do is to just plug it into the output and make sure that you're getting some sound out of it. There's nothing worse than kind of going through and patching a system, thinking you've kind of smashed it, and then you turn it up at the end and there's no sound coming out. So I've just taken this cable uh, and run it all the way over to this mixer over here, which is fed into an output, which then goes to the speakers. Cool. Good, it works. So that's just a just a triangle wave, so nice and pure. We can swap it. This one's got a bunch of different wave outputs. Ooh, some different notes going on there. Mm. Harmonics, very nice. Cool. So you might notice that this is just constantly outputting sound. Um, great if you're doing drum music, pretty terrible for basically anything else. Um, so this is where the amplifier, or VCA, kind of comes in. Um, the you'll see kind of VC and CV banded around a lot in modular. See, the CV stands for control voltage, and VC is the inverted version, just voltage controlled. So anything with a VC on it means it can be controlled using voltage signals from another module. Um, so if we go into, where's our, let me find a, I'm going to try and color code this whole thing. So we're going to do... The path of audio, I'll keep that in red. So, have you noticed I've kind of had to had to take the cable out and stick a new one in? This is one of the downsides of, of um, doing stuff live, and why you very kind of rarely you ever see people building a patch in a live scenario. Because um, if you want to add something into the chain of audio, you need to break the audio path, and then you're left with silence. There are some brave people who do live patching. Um, Brave also read mad, um, but some people do do it. So we've now patched this into our VCA module. This is a dope for one, the uh, the classic, the OGs. Um, and this one is it's actually four channels, so it can work as a mixer and as a and as four independent VCAs. So four independent volume circuits that we can use for different you know sounds, different functions. Um, and quite handily, it has a volume knob on it, so we can turn this up. 
Cool, sounds coming through. Let's swap that for something a little more buzzy. Cool. So, we have sound. Wonderful. Um, however, what we probably don't want to do is just have to manually play it the entire time. Um, because human wrists don't move that fast, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, you need your hands for doing other things while you're playing or in the studio, like clicking your mouse, drinking a cup of tea, drinking a beer. Um, so we need a way to kind of automate or control the level of this volume circuit using another module. We can use the kind of VC element, the voltage controllable element of it, um, to change the volume, which is where our envelope comes in. So also kind of known as the ADSR. Um, it's a what's known as a, a unipolar signal. So basically, it starts at nothing, it goes up, and then it comes back down to zero again. So it's really useful for turning things up and turning things back down. This can be volume, this can be filters, um, pitch, pretty much anything. Um, but we need to yeah use this to control our VCA. So there's an output on here, uh, which is just the, the kind of signal output, which is quite nicely labeled, uh, just says envelope. Uh, I don't know if anyone can see or if people, I don't know how, how good these cameras are if people can see on the stream, but the handy thing is that pretty much all the modules are labeled. Uh, they've all got um, some sort of, pretty much some sort of description for every input and output, so you know kind of roughly what you're going into um, and what you're coming out of. So I'm gonna take the envelope up and plug it into the CV in of channel one of our, our VCA. Uh, and this is gonna allow us to control the control the volume of this one. But as you may notice, nothing is happening. Um, similar to in, you know, a kind of keyboard synth, we need something to basically tell this envelope to output its kind of shape, its voltage shape. Um, there is a loop function on it, but I'm not gonna use that because it will be a little confusing at the moment. Um, you know, in a keyboard synth, you press a key, that key sends a little blip of electricity to an envelope, and then that opens the VCA, the volume circuit, and lets, kind of lets the oscillator sound come through. Um, however, in here, we don't have a keyboard. Um, what we do have is a sequencer, which we can use, um, which is this little guy over here. So we can, as it's running, I don't know if you can see from there with the light and everything, but um, this is just running a loop of eight steps. So um, it's just kind of cycling through eight individual kind of notes almost. And we can tell it on some notes to output this little kind of blip of electricity, which is known as a gate signal. Same thing that happens when you press a key. Um, and it will kind of run this automatically. So that's coming out. Uh, and our little gate signal goes into the handly named gate input on the envelope. And we have this beautiful sound, um, which we'll just continue playing kind of forever. However, it is a little buzzy and a little horrible, which is where I guess the final stage of the synth voice comes in, which is our pitch envelope. Is that a train? Is that a train? Sick. Okay. Is that better? Is that better? Okay, cool. Hello, whoever in the chat can't hear me. Hope this is a bit easier. Cool. So yeah, this is um, this is yeah a little bit um, a little bit buzzy and uh, not particularly pleasing to the ears. So. The next, the next thing that comes in is the filter stage. So filters are a way of removing certain frequency content. Either, uh, quite often they are either a low pass filter, so something that lets you have a, a kind of cutoff point, which is the frequency at which it starts to shelve off everything above or below. Low pass lets everything below the cutoff past. High pass lets everything above the cutoff past. Have a little listen to the uh, the difference between the two in a sec. But let's go into one of those. So again, the same way when we put the VCA in, we have to um, kind of break the chain of audio. So let's run that through here. 
We're going to take our output of our VCA into the filter, and then out of the filter, and then back into our mixer. And we can hear that that has given us a load more control over the sound. You know, we can take all that nasty high end out, and we can kind of shape the sound a little more. Um, so the the filter that we're hearing now is a Ooh. Ha ha ha, this is the s Oh yeah, question in the chat, what filter am I using? Uh, it is the System AT Jove Mark II. Um, it's based, l kind of, kind of based on the old Roland Jupiter 8 filter. So it's got a real nice... It's got a nice nose on it. Um, so yeah, it's uh it's very good, and but yeah, the the kind of filter circuit we're hearing now is the low pass filter. So as I decrease the cut off frequency, it's removing everything above that. So it's just letting the low signals pass. So we get this kind of nice, get nice basses out of it. Uh, if we flip, there we go. Uh, if we flip to the high pass one here. In the same position, we've now lost all of the bass, and it's only letting the high signals come through. Um, so this is good for doing more kind of build-ups and rises and things, and also for if you've got signals where things like lead sounds, pads and that, where maybe you want to remove some of the bass sound from them and just have them kind of sitting on nicely on top of everything else. There we go. Flip it back to low pass. We can just hear maybe a tiny bit of sub bass. There we go. These speakers aren't quite big enough, I think, to, to, to hack it. But yeah, there we go. So what we now have is a kind of single note, single note bass line sort of thing. Um, of course, the last thing we need to make this into a, an actual synth voice is some pitch. Um, you know, the most important thing, especially if you're doing anything melodic, anything kind of nice sounding. So, fortunately, our sequencer here, uh, this one is the Variegate 4, it's made by a company called Maleco out in the US, and it's effectively kind of four individual sequencers in one module. Um, they can be used for pitch, or they can be used for gate, so for kind of triggering things, uh, like our envelope, making kind of making things happen, um, or yeah, they have a pitch option. Um, now, pitch in modular uses a kind of specific standard. Because we can uh, tune it and because it's just voltage, it doesn't necessarily work like MIDI where you tell it I want a C and it will just play a C. Um, it uses something called volt per octave, which is a way of splitting it, splitting up the signal so you know that af if you increase the input signal by one volt, the sound will go up by one octave. Um, it's 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 kind of that's the best way to explain it really. Um, there is also lots of handy diagrams and things, um, but the main thing you need to know is if you're controlling pitch, that's the one you need to look for. Um, on some modules, it's just la the inputs are just labelled as pitch. Uh, on some, like this, uh, the generate, it's labelled as V slash oct. Um, so that's the kind of pitch one. So if we take uh, its sequence of one out of the Maleco, which is set to pitch mode. And we're going to plug that in. And then all we need to do is move some sliders and it will start giving us a bit of melody. So the sliders all the way over to the left, it's the lowest possible signal. And as we bring them up to the right, it's going to increase the pitch. But because. Cool. Now, because, so I've put in loads of different notes here, but because we're on, um, because we've just got basically kind of two gate signals coming in, we're only hearing the sound as it kind of comes through on kind of two steps. If we were to increase this and have this sending a kind of gate pulse on every single step, uh, then we'll be able to hear all the notes, hopefully. So let's slide these over. There we go, and we have a synth voice. And we 
can take uh, gates away on certain notes, so it means that our envelope won't be triggered, uh, and therefore no sound will come through. And we can go in and change the notes. So now that we've got all this set up, we've got you know a fair bit of control over things like the frequency content, over the shape of the sound. So you know, is it does it a kind of a slow sound that takes a while to build up? We can make it really short by changing the length of the individual stages of the envelope. We can make it really tiny. We can play around with the frequency content, you know, take all the bass out, put it into high pass mode, and we get this really teeny, tiny little kind of robotic sort of sound. So yeah, this is, you know, the kind of basics of, I guess, you know, building a, building a synth voice. Um, you know, and then from here we can elaborate, change things and start kind of like breaking it up and messing around with it. Um, it's also important to note that even though um, this is the kind of standard way that you would build a synth voice that you find in, you know, most kind of desktop synths and that, um, there's not really, you know, a wrong way to patch a modular system. Um, you know, you can, you don't have to use a VCA if you're doing drony stuff, there's all sorts of kind of different and unusual ways you can create kind of textures and melodies and sounds. Um, you know, this is just a bit of a, a bit of a guideline for that. Um, so yeah, I'm aware that we kind of blasted through that fairly quickly. So um, does anyone have any questions before we move on at all? How does the sequence measure time? Uh, so not on this one. So there is um, there are some sequences where you can set them to a specific tempo and tell it what tempo you want it to play at. And inside there, there's a little computer that kind of does the calculations. This one actually just has two sl uh, two sliders on it. Um, so if we put it into there's a, a, a kind of options mode where the sliders do different things um, and one of them says tempo course and one says tempo fine so we can speed it up that's a bit nicer so yeah, um, there is also a clock input on this, so we can sync it to other external things. Um, the way that clock works in modular um, is kind of the same idea with like an actual analog clock. It ticks, um, you know. Whereas with MIDI, there's kind of decoding and encoding of, of digital information. Here, um, we can actually listen to the clock. Um, so if I plug this in. That's what a clock sounds like. Every time it ticks, it kind of moves on one step. So if we wanted to say sync something else, we could plug this into it, and every time it received a little one of those little pulses, the things that we're hearing as clicks, it then moves on to the next step. So rather than like running in time, it's kind of following um, and kind of it knows when it's being told to move on to the next step. Um, yeah. Um, there is, yeah, there's also stuff that will, will convert like MIDI information to control voltage. So if you wanted to say, you know, have your modular synced in time with a drum machine or your, you know, your door or something else in the studio, then, you know, it can be done pretty easily nowadays. Um, it used to be a pain in the ass, now it's a lot easier to do. Cool. Um, ooh, question from the chat. I'm not. Uh, what mo sorry, the question was what module am I using as a clock? Um, the variegate itself has its own internal clock. Um, when I perform live, I actually use a separate sequencer as a clock, so I can kind of clock MIDI instruments, so drum machines and samplers, at the same time as a modular. Um, but here, the variegate itself has its own internal clock, um, which is very handy.
Yes. Okay. Yeah. No. Good question. Yeah. So, so it is. Is it is it a genuinely mad idea to make patches live? And if so, how do you prepare for a gig? Okay, I guess kind of um, fundamental bit of the question. So um, personally, I if I have a gig coming up, I will maybe a week or two before um, start putting a patch together. I've got a, a handful of kind of. You know, if I'm doing a club set, I kind of know what I'm building. I know that I need the two synth voices. I know how I need my effects rooted. So that's kind of fairly standard by this point um, and fairly easy to recreate. Um, and then I'll sit with it for, you know, a few hours um, over the course of the week before and just actually play it and make sure that, you know, there might be a point where I'm like, oh, I'd, I'd really like to get some wobble on that filter or I'd like to do some really chaotic, noisy stuff at some point, so I'll kind of add that in and make sure that I know where everything is before I go to the gig. I have done the one before where I've turned up and patched the system in sound check with headphones on, and it always goes really badly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so can you set um, scales and things within um, this sequencer specifically, the variegate, and also yeah, other ones? Yes, you can. Um, so the way that you would say tune a module, um, I tend to just use um, like a phone tuner app. But what you'd do is you'd send it like a certain, you'd send it nothing, no notes at all, um, which we can do. Um, boop -a -doo. wrong channel. I've had this for like six years and I keep forgetting how it works. Um, so yeah, you send it no notes and then you would tune your oscillator to whatever you want it to be. Let's say for argument's sake, that's a C. I have no idea, I've got no good pitch. Um, but yeah, there is a scale option. So where I mentioned the volt per octave idea, Effectively, you're breaking down um, like a one volt signal into 12, 12 individual tones, uh, well, 12 individual kind of little kind of pockets. Um, and in order to do the scaling, it just removes some of those pockets, so we'll automatically kind of jump up to the next one, the same way that when you're playing on a keyboard, there's certain notes you miss. Um, so if we stick another, stick another series of notes in here. Let's speed that up a bit as well. Cool. So with no scaling on, we get uh, what's called like a raw voltage signal. So this isn't kind of scaled at all, um, hence why it sounds kind of chaotic. Um, but what you can do is apply various different scales, make it sound a little prettier. So yeah, it's, um, it is doable. There's also... Um, you know, for some sequences that don't have inbuilt uh, scaling, uh, you can get kind of quantizer modules, which are able to take any signal and kind of fit that into something scaled, which is a really good way to create kind of, you know, random patterns and things. You can take randomized signals and turn them into actually kind of like quantized notes, uh, which is a very popular way of doing sort of generative patches where it's constantly kind of coming up with new motifs and new ideas. Uh, on the fly. Uh, I sadly don't have one of those because I rarely ever play in tune. <laughs> so, but um, if I did, I would definitely have one because they are very, very good and very useful. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fun and kind of unique approach to tuning sometimes. Um, especially, I think when you know we're kind of trained in the Western standard of having a piano with twelve notes, and you sit down in front of it and go ding, and go, okay, cool, that's evidently a G because that's the key I've pressed. Whereas here, you can kind of press a key and go, that's not even a note, it's just a <laughs> sound, um, which is fun. Yeah, cool. Um, any more questions? Yes. Uh, this one. This is the this is the Laqualica Teratas. So this is, oh yeah, repeat question for the stream. Uh, how do I use the BIA? Um, 
This is the, the oscillator version of it. So for anyone who's not familiar, the BIA is the Basimilus Iteritus Alter, which is by a company called Noise Engineering, one of my faves. Um, they, uh, it's a very popular kind of percussion module. This is actually the uh, oscillator module that preceded it, the Liquelic Iteritus. Um, so it's the same idea, um, but what it doesn't have is any of the, it doesn't have an internal VCA. So again, for anyone here on the stream who's not familiar with the idea of a percussion module, um, it effectively kind of packs all of these things into one little package. So you can use it for kicks, hi-hats, snares, but it's got an internal envelope and an internal VCA. So you just send it a trigger and it makes a sound straight away rather than having to build it out of you know, a handful of modules, you can just have a single module uh, that does all of that. Um, and yeah, the in the core of the BIA is the same oscillator as, as this one. Um, I'm just, you know, I kind of like being able to drone it. Um, but if we swap it, if we swap this nicer uh, analog oscillator for the Liquelica Teratas, you'll see why it's um, a favorite. <laughs> So it's a... It's a... It's an angle, I think. So it's capable of a pretty wide range of sounds very quickly and very easily. Uh, and this comes from the fact that inside here, there are actually two oscillators. Um, there's tu individual tunings for either of them. Um, and you can kind of use them to control each other, which is where you get all of this. Kind of really chaotic and noisy sounds. Anyway. So yeah. Um, but I mostly use it for like big squelchy, noisy stuff because it goes down really low very well. Um, but yeah, the BIA is also an amazing module. They have really good fun. Great for great for hi hats. Yeah. Ooh, CV scale modules. Um, I'm assuming yes. So whoever this is in the chat. Uh, Yes, uh, there are there are CV scaling modules, um, which is effectively, I think for if I think if I understand the question correctly, um, similar idea to quantizers. There is also um, you can scale control voltage and uh, use what's called uh, an attenuator to kind of increase or decrease the level of it, which we'll have a look at in a minute actually. Um, also, yeah, a mention of VCV rack there, which is a really really good free. Um, bit of software, uh, which is effectively a kind of digital modular environment. You can drag, you know, modules in. You can drag patch cables between them, uh, and it simulates the idea of a, a modular system. Um, it's really good. It's free. You can save stuff and come back to it. You can download other people's patches and have a look at how they've done stuff. Um, it's way less fun and way less cool than this, but. Um, no, it's, it's actually really, really good. Um, but it's a really, really good resource for if you're kind of curious about modular, but you don't have the funds or the access to it to kind of get into it, or if you just want, you know, an, a nice extra addition for making some kind of interesting noises. Uh, it will also rewire into, I think, pretty much every available door, um, which is really good. Um, so yeah, well worth checking out. Um, Does anyone have any more questions? Or should we make some drum sounds? Cool, drum sounds. So, one thing that I did actually forget to put in here. Let's go back to our... Cool, let's go back to our, uh, our nice analog oscillator. So one thing I did forget to put in here, um, in my, uh, my haste, was uh, a filter envelope. And this is, um, again, something that's kind of commonly found on uh, most desktop synths. It's a way to, you know, use our envelope signal to open the filter. Creates a nice kind of like bouncy effect. It can be very good, really good for doing acidy things. It's generally very handy. Um, however, this is a good example of where 
Only being able to send one signal to one place, you know, requires a bit of a workaround. So we've got our envelope here, which we're using for the amplitude of the uh, amplitude of the uh, the oscillator. However, we've only got one envelope output and one cable, and we can only send it to one place at a time. We could put it into the filter, but then it's not controlling the amplitude. So this is where handy little things like this come in. Uh, this is called a stackable cable, and it allows you to split a signal and send it to a bunch of different places. Um, it's got a jack on the bottom, and then a little kind of jack socket on the top. Uh, these are made by a company called Tip Top Audio, um, and they're super handy. So, put this one in first, and we can then plug this uh, VCA kind of CV cable into the top. That signal passes through. We can then take the other end of it and put this into our filter. And we get a little bit more life. Bring the resonance up, we get a bit of that. A little bit of that squelch. And often, you know, for playing live, this is kind of one of the controls that we use a lot, um, is being able to change the, amp the filter envelope to bring more or less of the sound through um, without necessarily having to mess around too much with the filter cut. And the way I'm doing this brings in, yeah, the idea of CV scaling uh, or attenuation. So you might see that where I've patched into here, there is a little kind of knob above it. This is an attenuator and it effectively works like a tap or like a, you know, commonly more known sometimes as a depth control. And it allows us to control how much of this signal is getting through to the filter to control it. So if I turn this all the way down, it's not getting through at all. You know, we can manually move the filter, but nothing's happening. It's kind of staying at one fixed position. I'm going to put it all the way down so we can kind of hear it a bit better as an example. And as I bring this up, we'll be able to hear the the envelope having more of an effect on the filter cutoff and the filter opening more or allowing kind of more high frequencies through as we go on. So yeah, all the way at full, we're getting all the kind of like high frequencies through. Give it a bit more welly on the resonance. If we bring it down to halfway, it's a little bit more subtle. And yeah, if we bring it down a lot more, we're just getting a kind of little bump on the bass. So this is how you, you know, by setting the, the filter cut off and then how much it's opening, we can get really subtle kind of bassy stuff, or we can get full, you know, fully open sort of acidy. Yeah. So yeah, attenuators super handy. Uh, quite a lot of modules have them built in. Um, quite a lot of modules don't. If they don't, this is where you know through the joys of modular, you can just buy a separate module that just exists for attenuating signals, um, which are really handy. They come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and features. Some of them you can use to mix signals together, um, and some of them, you know, just you plug it in, it gives you a kind of level control, and then just gives you an output again. So, with that in mind, attenuators are very handy for the idea of um, kind of percussion synthesis. So, I'm just going to yeah, have a quick run through that, maybe a couple of, an exa a couple of examples. Um, so yeah, one thing that Modular is very good at is for you know making your own sounds, making your own samples and things that you can either work with later in the door, <coughs> uh, that you can you know chuck in a sampler. Um, but it's a you know good way to create a bunch of unique um, sounds and kind of yeah banks that are unique to you. Um, and also, yeah, drums. Everyone loves drums. Drums are really handy. So one of the ways that we can quite easily turn this patch into, say, something like a, you know, a kind of kick drum. Um, so we can take the pitch out. Because you know, when has ever, anyone ever heard a kick drum change pitch outside of retuning an 808? And 
let's change, take a few gates out so this isn't as cool. So it's not kind of ticking away as much. So this is kind of close to the idea. There we go. But, you know, not quite maybe. It's not got the slap that a kind of drum does. Um, and one thing I think, especially when we're doing like percussion synthesis in modular, it's handy to consider, you know, how a real world drum works. There's a whack sound as the beater strikes the skin, and then there's the kind of bass that comes as the air moves afterwards. You know, when you're doing kind of like synth sounds and lead sounds and pads, you don't need to consider the kind of physical world so much because actually, kind of pushing beyond that's pretty fun. But you know, with drums and things you want it to sound like a drum and then you can kind of go and you know mutilate it a bit afterwards so one very handy way of doing this is um, again by using an envelope um, so this can be a uh, what's known as a pitch envelope so we're using it to control the pitch and what that's going to give us is a bit of a kind of like boom at the start of the sound and then it will naturally decay away into being a bit bassier so for this, I'm going to reroute our filter envelope here, and I'm going to plug it into the oscillator. Now, on this one, we've got, as well as the pitching, there's a couple of inputs which allow us to control the frequency, but not in a necessarily kind of pitchy way. These are called frequency modulation inputs, or FM inputs. Um, and these also quite handily have little attenuators on them so we can control um, how much of that signal's coming through. So, with it all the way up, we get this nice, nice laser sound. Um, but as we bring it down, and as we bring the kind of attenuator down, so the pitch envelope is having less of an effect, we get a bit more of your kind of typical kick sound. Now, you know, it sounds fairly kind of thuddy and standard. So we're using a, um, a triangle wave, which is a fairly kind of pure wave. But if we swap this out for maybe, you know, something with a few more harmonics. Cool. Sounds like a wet cough. Let's see what else we got. Yep. These are all sounding. Well, that one's got a bit more weight to it. There we go. Maybe stick a filter on it, and we've got a nice, pretty kind of hefty subwoofer, uh, sort of kind of hefty sub kick. Um, or alternatively, we could swap this for, you know, a different oscillator. Maybe. Significantly more experimental, Laquella Cateritas oscillator, which is going to give us these kind of yeah, weirder percussion sounds. And by again, kind of using a filter. We can shape that into something, you know, that's a fair bit more aggressive than a kind of standard, um, standard kind of kick drum. And then we've got loads of control on here. So yeah, kind of pushing it, pushing it a bit further and making something kind of fair bit more unique out of it. So now it sounds a bit more like a BIA. <laughs> this is what the that module sounds like. Um, and just to kind of yeah illuminate how easy it is then to kind of get you know kind of um, say more a little bit more movement in here. Uh, we've got a few uh, this kind of little sequencer module here. Uh, this is the voltage block. It's another Maleco module, um, and it's pretty handy. What's the kind of what's known as a latching sequencer. So if I move any of the sliders on this, it will then kind of start outputting where I've moved it to. So it's kind of recording all of the time. Um, 
And if we take these cables out, you can see if we move move these, these LEDs will start flashing. So it's a good way to kind of start performing um, very quickly with things. So let's chuck these, you know, we'll take three of these sequences and just run them into a few different parameters on this oscillator and see what we can get out of it. Let's say chuck one into the filter as well. Get the cutoff moving a bit. Yeah, that was, um, but now, completely different percussion sound. Nice, weird little kind of whoop sound. And the idea, I guess, here is you'd be, you know, you'd run this into your computer, so similar to how you would record another instrument or, you know, run this into your sampler, um, just out and into an interface. And then you can sit for hours and frustrate your neighbours by making all these weird noises but then at the end of it you can go through and just cut out each individual sound and each individual sound will be something unique granted as a stream they might not sound great um, but let's see what else we can push this to so we've got some more kind of hi-hat sort of sounds just by, you know, kind of closing up our envelope so it's much shorter um, and turning the pitch up on our oscillator. Uh, let's maybe change to swap the filter out for a high pass. So it's just, we're getting rid of all of that kind of like tap and click at the bottom end. And yeah, we've got a tiny, tiny little hi-hat. Uh, let's throw a few more gates, gate pulses in there so it's a bit more regular. And if we just wanted to, you know, kind of strip it back so it's just, you know, we can get like maybe just a nice kind of steady loop out of it. And just take the sequences out. It's very, very quiet, but we've got some nice kind of like tinny hi-hat sounds going on there. So yeah. So with, you know, percussion synthesis, when you're doing things like um, things that have a natural kind of pitch change in them, so toms, um, kick drums and things like that where you want it to kind of strike and come through really clear but there might be a little drop um, a little kind of boom at the end um, then pitch envelopes are really handy for things like you know doing um, hi-hats um, some snares and things uh, you don't necessarily need it but it's just about thinking you know what components go into that with a hi-hat it's a very tinny metallic sound so something quite high-pitched maybe quite noisy swapping the filter so you're actually getting rid of all the low frequencies and just focusing on the higher frequencies. Um, you know, with a snare drum, you get a bit of both. There's an actual kind of drum head and a body in there, so there is a kind of tone, but then there's also the kind of like crack and rattle of the noise underneath it. So a good way to do snares is to just blend a little bit of the two together. Um, but yeah, let's we'll see what's... Uh, now this is just... Yeah, this is just a really high pitch note now. But yeah, so yeah, good trick with percussion synthesis. Just take the pitch control out uh, and replace it with a pitch envelope and it will give you a little bit more movement, um, which was kind of, yeah, that bit really. Um, no questions? Thanks, whoever you are in the chat. Appreciate it.
Yeah, also shouts out to Hamish, who also works at the shop, and James, and Fiona, and um, Jamie, and Marco, of course, um, the whole crew. Hi, guys. I hope you're... Yeah, I think so. So I think now would be a good time to do that. Because um, otherwise, I'm just going to keep barreling into more complicated stuff. So it might be worth, yeah, actually kind of having a little play around with it. So yeah, if... Um, I guess if we're streaming, we can't just have loads of people gathered around the table, can we? Cool. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So let's let's do that. So if everyone wants to jump up and 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 come come gather around. Um, well, this is weird. Everyone's really close, but I've still got to talk into the microphone. Um, all right. There we go. Cool. Um, yeah. Forward a bit. There we go. Cool. Um, so first things first. Um, I'm just gonna pop a little. Let's have something going on. And let's just put this little synth voice together, and then we can start messing around with it. Uh, let's take some steps out, and let's make this, why do you sound weird? Oh, it's because it's really short. Cool. All right. Um, I'm just going to turn this around so you can actually have a go on it. Um, one sec. Here is the sequencer. Uh, the first channel here is your notes. So we can go in, we can change the note information. Second sequencer is our gate pattern. Again, we can go in, change the information here. This one works on a kind of probability basis. So if you slide the slider all the way over to the right, you know that it's gonna output that gate signal for a little blip every time. Um, if you put it in the middle, it might not. There we go. That's a bit better. Yeah, envelope controls the shape of the signal. We've got a filter here for the um, frequency information, and then we've put the put the slightly more fun oscillator in there. But yeah, I mean, have a go. If anyone wants to have a little, you know, play around with the sequence and things, and then we can start kind of adding more things into it as we go. So yeah. yeah fire away. Ah, so these buttons allow you to change like different what you're doing. So this one's kind of note, so they're labeled underneath. So this is note. Beneath that is glide, so that's like a slide between the steps. Um, so it gives you a little whoop. Um, and then there's kind of saving and loading and things. Um, but yeah, they allow you to kind of change between what functions depending on what kind of mode you're in. So the gate one, you've got probability and then repeats. So we can have... So we can hear that that steps repeating a bunch of times. So you get these little kind of rolls. There we go. And we're off. Thank you. 
Yeah, there we go. Sorry, back to it. I keep forgetting the damn microphone. So yeah, there are so on the Verigate there are four individual channels. Um, they are either gate, so on and off, CV, which is pitch, um, or a kind of combination of the two, depending on which ones we've got set. So we've got it on two and two. So we've got one here, which is note. So when we select channel one, it will just automatically jump to note. Um, so we can tell that this is the, the sequence that's being used for the notes. We press two, it will automatically jump to probability, which shows us that it's the kind of gate one. So if we want to change the notes, you go to channel one. <laughs> Yeah, so this one's the envelope. So this is the, there are four stages to an envelope. Attack, decay, sustain, and release. So how long does the sound take to come in? How loud is the sound if it's being held? Um, and then when you let go, the release is kind of how long does the sound take to disappear? So if you, you know, turn all the knobs down, you'll get a really short sound. Um, turn them up, you get a really long sound. Yes, yeah, so there's the, yeah, the decay stage is the kind of second one. Um, and you do get, you do kind of get, you can get two stage envelopes as well, which are just attack and decay, which are the ones that you kind of more commonly find in a, you know, in like percussion modules. Because generally, you know, a snare doesn't go for stages. Uh, it happens and then it disappears kind of fairly quickly. Yeah. So yeah, your top your top ones on here are pitch. And then the four, these four at the bottom do different different things. They're kind of specific to this oscillator. So you can have them kind of Yes. No, so with with modular, if it's not plugged in, it's not doing anything at all. The only thing that goes on behind the case is power. So, although it might be kind of flashing and looking like it's doing something in time, it might be kind of coincidentally just running at a similar time. But um, yeah, because it's not connected to anything, it's having no influence on the sound at all. Yeah, yeah, it's on, you know, they're all, they're all, once you kind of turn the case on, they're all on and they're all running and doing their own things, but only when you make the connection between them does something happen. So, that's actually a good one. We could maybe, let's plug this one in. So, this is uh, the Felistri by Frap Tools. Um, it's so pretty, um, which is half the reason I bought it. Um, so this is a, a modulation source. So this can generate LFOs, so low frequency oscillators. Um, it can generate envelope signals. It can do something called slewing, where if you have a kind of sharp change in voltage, so say you jump from 0 volts to 2 volts, slew will turn that sharp jump into a kind of slow curve, yeah, into a glide. Uh, yeah, so when we slew notes, it's called glide or portamento or glissando, any of the many names for it. But yeah, in in when it's when it's used for control voltage, it's generally called slewing. Um, same thing people do when they get drunk. Oh, chat question. What's this one in the chat? Is it the Basimula Ceteritas Alter you've been using? No, it is the um, the Laquella Ceteritas, the oscillator version. Um, the OG is the first module I ever bought seven years ago. I literally had a case with that in it, and that was it. So I just made drone music for like six months because it's mad expensive. Um, I dip my toes back into making drone music every now and again. Um, yeah, so with this one, there's there's kind of two channels. There's the the yellow channel and the green channel, and we can speed them up and slow them down. We can control the rise. So, so you know when I mentioned a second ago that there are kind of two stage envelopes that are attack and decay. That's what these are. So the first one controls the attack and how or how long it takes to rise, and then 
This one controls the fall, so we can have a sharp attack and a long, or, or a kind of sharp rise and then a long fall, so it kind of just goes Ew. Or, you know, if we flip it the other way, we turn the rise up, but turn the fall down, it's going to take, and you can tell by this little red LED, sorry for anyone on the stream, that it's taken, it takes a while to come up and then it just drops away. So we can kind of really shape the sound with this. Um, so one thing this is really good for is filters. So if we take the output of this, plug it into our filter, and speed it up a bit. And let's... Here we go. So, we've taken the output of this, and it's just kind of basically a kind of wave that's just going up and down and opening and closing the filter. This is then running into another attenuator, so we can, if we want to make, kind of bring that signal down and have it affecting the filter cut off less, make it subtle, make it a little wobbly. Can do. Ooh, mod wheel slew. Um, yeah. So there is. You could. Um, one way that you could do that would be to have. Um, you can get kind of. Um, kind of like interactive modules. Um, so joysticks, wheels, touch pads, pressure pads, and things like that. Um, and some of them will have kind of slewing built into them. So that can be a good way to, if you want to have something where you kind of interact with it a little bit more. I'm a big fan of joystick modules because you can kind of patch them into loads of things and then you nudge it a little bit and everything kind of goes crazy for a minute. Um, but yeah, for I guess, yeah, you could take a, you could take a signal, slew it, and it would kind of go up and come down but what you wouldn't have is a huge amount of control over actually being able to play that um, so yeah we can oh the other fun thing that we can do so this also goes really fast so as well as kind of doing this wobbly stuff we can run this at what's called audio rate which is where we start to it gets to kind of the speed where you'd be able to pick it up as you know with your human ears uh, which are you know notoriously kind of rubbish for going like really really low so we have to kind of get to high frequencies before we can hear them but what is really fun is when those if we use kind of audio rate signals but not in a way where we can hear them we just use them to control things so if we speed this up so if you want to just turn those counterclockwise we'll have a listen to what happens Ooh, let's do both of them counterclockwise way. There we go. So now what we've got So, squirchy fart noise. So what we've now got So what we're now doing is moving the cutoff of the filter. So moving the kind of filter frequency, but at thousands of times a second. So what it's starting to do is take on the properties of the kind of waveform that we're using to control it. Very good question. Yeah, what's the difference between LFOs and, and, and audio rate oscillators? Technically nothing. They both do exactly the same thing. They both oscillate between two points and output a wave shape. Um, some LFOs, so this one here is the Batumi by Zayot Devices. This is a kind of LFO bank. It's designed to run below audio rate. You can push it higher, but once it gets to a higher frequency, it's really unstable. Um, it doesn't hold pitch very well. Uh, whereas audio rate oscillators are designed to kind of go really fast. But fundamentally, there is no real difference. They both do exactly the same thing, just at different speeds. And with some, like this guy, it can do both. I believe there's a little musical input, although I've never used it, where you can get it to kind of play in pitch. Let's try it. 
Um, so, if someone wants to find out what channel on the variegate is the pitch one, so if you just press three or four, whichever one says note. Cool. All right, so, there's patch cable. So if you go, there's output three up here, into that one. And then if we come into this one here, which is the musical input, and then hit some sliders, and we'll see what happens. So just w wiggle some sliders. There we go. Let's give this a little tweak. There we go. Now that's an interesting sound. And that's something that might take ages to get that specific noise on a computer. Um, not shitting on computers too much, although I'm terrified of the music making. It's, you know, modular is the kind of environment where you can just play around and see what happens. Um, you know, if we move the pitch on this, suddenly, yeah, big kind of squelchy pressure dome sort of bass thing. Yeah, exactly. And it's because everything is all kind of doing its own thing. There's no inherent sync. Everything is kind of designed to work completely on its own. And when you start patching them together, especially when you're running, you know, things really fast, there's, there's going to be loads of points where like wave shapes cross over, signals cross over, but in a way that's kind of not really predictable at all. Um, so we can push this even further. What can we do here? So we've got, let's see, we've got more, more outputs. Um, so a lot of these ones down the side here are outputs. Uh, we've got some inputs on the oscillator. Um, we've got some effects. If you want to have a listen, patch in some effects maybe. Yeah. Uh, okay, distortion, reverb, or delay. Reverb. Cool. So, same as I mentioned before, um, unfortunately, when we're adding anything into the audio path, we need to break up, um, we need to effectively kind of take out a stage of it and add something in. So, we've got an output on the filter, um, labelled VCF out. So, if someone wants to pull that cable out, and it's going to go silent. So, we've broken the chain from our filter out to the output. So, there's patch cable. So, we now need to come out of the filter output and into this guy, which is the uh, Dismodus Versio, which is also by Noise Engineering, hence because they're my faves. There we go. Ellen, yeah, there we go. Cool. And we'll see that started to light up now. Uh, it is freaking out a little bit because that is a very hot signal. Cool. And then, in order to hear the signal, we need to then come out of this module and into back into our output. Yeah, so if we want to slow it down, uh, this is a fun one. So on here, you've got to press the one that says track, the one that says track below it. There we go. And then the bottom two sliders say tempo coarse and tempo fine. So if you move those, you might need to give them a little wiggle. Yeah, sometimes they, uh, they need a little bit of encouragement. There we go. So on the reverb, we have control over things like the size, the reverb type. There's also internal modulation, so we can get the reverb actually moving around a bit. And, you know, as with all of them, we've got all of these inputs. So for every knob on here, there is an input that controls the same parameter. So we can kind of automate stuff as well. Um, so one that was a fun one that we were looking at yesterday was using an LFO to control the reverb. Um, so we can take, say, let's do this one. So, patch cable. There we go. Ah, on brand as well. That is one of the uh, synth cables. 
Uh, so we've got our Batumi here, which is our LFO bank. So this is four LFO circuits. Um, each one's an individual channel, and you can kind of see them as they light up. That's the wave kind of coming up into its positive, going back down to negative. Uh, and then each each channel has three different wave formats. So we've got sine wave, nice kind of smooth one. Um, the middle one I think is doing a saw wave, so the kind of one that looks like a, like a ramp. Uh, and then the bottom one's a square wave, which is just on and off. So yeah, choose your weapon. And then uh, what's the dramatic one? Size. So if we go into the size input on there. So what we're doing here is kind of drastically... Imagine you're in a room that goes from being infinitesimally enormous to being, like, super tiny. That's effectively what this is doing. Uh, the other fun thing with this... Ah, so now it's going... There's now this LFO is running really slowly. So we'll be able to hear it in a second. Room gets bigger. Room keeps getting bigger. So it's huge. And it's, it should start shrinking. now you're in a tiny kind of tin can. So, you know, this is, <laughs> it's, this is, yeah, kind of an example. And, you know, you can kind of just keep playing. So it's the first slider that's controlling the speed. There we go. So you can do stuff that sounds really nice, really quickly. Um, also, this does have a, different, a few different ways that um, the modulation will affect the size. So at the moment, it's just in what's called bend, which is where you don't hear the pitch change as the size changes. If someone flips that, that bottom switch into the middle, it will get extra bits. So now, in a similar way to like the way a tape delay works, as the room shrinks, the pitch goes up. As the space gets bigger, it goes down. So one thing with this one, and also one thing with the, the Quellic, is they don't have any attenuators on them. Um, it's a design choice. It means that noise engineering can keep the modules a certain size. Also, because noise engineering make a bunch of attenuator modules, so you can just have one of those. Um, but what this means is that now we're controlling the size, the room is, you know, the, the theoretical room is going from as big as it could possibly ever be to as small as it could possibly be. And sometimes we don't want that much change. It's kind of disorienting. So, if we wanted to make this more subtle, we do have um, an attenuator module here. Uh, it's the three times MIA, which stands for Mix Invert Attenuate, uh, by a company called Happy Nerding, who are lovely. Uh, it's a guy called Eagle, um, who lives in Tenerife now. Um, lovely, lovely chap. Uh, makes these really cool modules with two two knobs on each knob, which, if you can't see on the screen, just imagine it. So, if we want to control the level of this signal, and you know, have less more, uh, less of a uh, intense size change going on. We can run this LFO into either the A or B on the one of these. Um, so if someone wants to have a crack at that, there we go. Cool. So yeah, any A or B, lovely. And then we kind of come out of the the A B on this channel. So it's kind of three channel, three pairs going to size. So now, with nothing, with this knob bang in the middle, it's not 
doing anything. It's not actually letting any signal through. As you bring, kind of start turning it up, and I think it's just the, the top middle one, you should see the lights on the sides start to react. So you can turn it all the way up, and that will give you the full range signal. Or, if you bring it down, it will give you more subtle effect. <laughs> but, if you turn it the other way, so this one works slightly differently to a traditional attenuator. A traditional attenuator just turns things from, you know, zero up to full. Whereas this one has an I in it, which stands for invert. So this is technically known as an attenuverter. Um, so what this is capable of doing, as well as um, kind of controlling the level of the signal, is actually flipping it upside down. So turning positive signals into negative signals, and vice versa. It doesn't work super well with an LFO, because um, it's a, what's known as a bipolar signal anyway, so it kind of goes, goes both ways, goes up and down. Um, but if we were using this with, say, you know, a sequence or an envelope, which just goes up, and then kind of comes back to zero, we can flip that and use it to turn things on. So if we print this up in the middle. So we can get some more subtle size changes. So the bottom one controls channel B. So there's an A and B input, and yeah, what's known as a double stacked mod. With nothing plugged into it, uh, this works as an, what's called an offset. So it's a way to just generate a fixed voltage. So if you turn that one, turn the bottom one up, you'll notice that instead of swinging from green to blue, it will just go from kind of green to a bit more green. And if you turn it down, it goes the other way. So what this is doing, so this is a kind of, yeah, a two-channel two -channel, uh, CV mixer. One of the channels is this little kind of, this now kind of shrunk down little LFO. We've attenuated the signal, so it's quite small. But then what the offset's done is shifted that really, really low. So there's still a little wobble, but it's at the, it's kind of at the uh, a, a negative voltage. So it's a really low level wobble. So this is, a, this is a really good way that we can have really subtle effects, but move them and kind of change where they're having their effect. I'll turn this all the way up. Oh no, wrong way, really big size. There we go. So the wobble's still there, but we've used this offset to effectively turn the size knob all the way up to full. As we bring it down, that will go into negative, and effectively what negative does is just turns things down. So once we go into negative, it's now made the size, kind of turned it all the way down to zero. We've still got our LFO in here, so you can see that the blue LED here is kind of getting brighter and dimmer. So it's showing you that there is some kind of movement in there, but it's kind of, yeah, fairly low down in the voltage. So it's kind of having an effect by turning the parameter all the way down and then modulating it a little bit as it's turned all the way down. Ooh. I like, that's my favorite question. Um, it's a box of dirt. Um, so this module is um, a bit of an experimental one. Uh, it's designed by a guy called Martin House, who runs um, Micro Research, uh, who's, a, who's a kind of artist. Um, and it's, it, yeah, it's dirt from um, some tombs in Greece. Um, but what it does is it has a kind of has a kind of distortion effect. Um, it's also incredibly temperamental. So I'll try and get it to work. I don't know if it will. Um, I actually don't often keep this one in the case because it is so temperamental. Um, this usually stays in. So this this system here is usually just. Um, a load of distortion modules that, that's used for kind of processing things. But let's see. So. Uh, it's called the Earth Return Distortion. And 
he makes 10 of them at a time. He also did a vampire one where the dirt is from, so this one's um, from the Tombs of the Fates in Greece. Um, <laughs> wait for it. The vampire one, the dirt is from Transylvania uh, and Dracula's supposed burial site at Whitby Abbey. <laughs> and it used to be, it used to be that if you wanted one, you had to go and get the dirt yourself and post it to him. Um, but as a, as a, he performs quite a lot with using um, like these big mounds of clay and earth and chemicals, um, using something called potential difference. So you chuck loads of like electrical signals into it, and it measures how the dirt absorbs or how the kind of organic matter absorbs that, um, how much electricity is absorbed by the organic matter, and then it kind of does some calculations. But this one is not doing what it should be. <laughs> There's a surprise. Um, let's, uh, yeah, it's just not having a good day today, is it? Let's try and bypass the dirt. So effectively what it does there we go, is grounds the module through the dirt. But there's quite a handy way we can bypass this. So if you want to hold that one. Have you got pacemaker by any chance? OK, no, we're good. So. What we should be able to do now. There we go. <laughs> so you can kind of bypass the box of dirt and ground yourself through it. Um, it's really fun if you put both the cables in your mouth. You can taste it. Um, yeah, you can. It's 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 it, the voltage is high enough that you can. Feel, it's like licking a battery. Um, I'd, not that I recommend doing that. Um, but yeah, it's a it's an it's an interesting module. It's a kind of experimental distortion module. Um, I'm just a big fan of his work. So, um, Martin Howes, H O W S E. Um, and actually, oh, I'm a nice one. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Actually, while we're on the note of weird stuff. Patching the sample. Oh, well, look, there's a, there's a mic stand over here. Cool, there we go. Oh. That's better. Uh. Cool. So, um, yeah, I've just plugged in the little sample case as well, because this might always be worth having a little crack at. So, like I mentioned, this case is usually just um, full of distortions and works as a kind of texturizer and processing system. Um, can someone unwind that for me? Thank you. Um, but for today, I've kind of, as an example of where you could create like a small system, uh, so that goes into this external mic in, um, and then what you could use it for. Um, I've put together this. Here's one I made earlier. So, uh, let's come out of here. So, in here, we have a microphone. Um, I hear you. Give it a one, two. Try again. Oh, why are you not working now? Oh, it doesn't want to work. Oh. Come on, little guy. Came all this way. <laughs> Check. Okay, I think the I think my microphone's broken. Um, okay, here's a fun alternative. Um, is there a fizzy glass of water around at all? Thanks. Um, yeah, just 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 something fizzy. I've got an idea. So, yeah, in this case is a. Um, some distortions, a little speaker, um, headphone output, and two inputs. One of them um, is a mic input, which is supposed to work with that tiny little microphone. Um, however, I think I've used it for too many gigs and it's kind of died, which is unsurprising because it's a tiny flimsy little thing. Um, however, here we have a contact microphone. Ah, amazing. Um, could I get, a, is there a glass? Thanks. There we go. So let's.
So I don't know if they, this one does enough gain for that. It might just be a little... Oh, thanks. Okay, so here's a fun one. If someone could decant the glass of fizzy water into that, and basically, yeah, what this is is a contact microphone. It's a little flat disc that you can put on things and use it for stuff, yeah. However, because it's encased in plastic, what it's also very good for Oh, why are none of my input modules working today? Boo! Yeah, I don't think it's worked. <laughs> it's not worked. <laughs> oh no. Oh, now I feel like a fool. It's not, maybe not. Well, it should usually at least... Um, no, <laughs> I've, <laughs> um, no, I have just these, these modules and specifically the, the two microphones have seen quite a lot of, um, volatile live performance. So, um, they, oh, there we go. It's alive. Cool. So we have a little something that you can tap it with. Now, what I've got this running into is a, um, as a sampler module. So if we get this recording, and then if you just tap away on the glass. Cool, I think that's good. So what we've hopefully captured there is a bunch of really horrible noise. But what we can do with that, so this is what's known as a granular sampler. Everyone come across the, across the term granular before? So for anyone who hasn't, in here and on the stream, it's a way of kind of processing sound where you can play back loads and loads and loads of tiny snippets of it. And we can control the speed of that sound and we can control the pitch of that sound. This is the Nebulae, which is uh, made by a company called Qubit Electronics. So we can say, In fact, I am just going to plug it into a little bit of overdrive. Nope, I'm not, because I unplugged that earlier. <laughs> the chaos. Right, let's use this one. A uh, little bit of drive. It's really fun trying to do this with one hand. There we go. That's more like it. Cool, so we can control the pitch and the speed. There we go. Um, so we can have just little snippets playing. The start point allows us to move around. Create these kind of very intense sounds. And yeah, density is how many versions of that sound are playing over the top of each other at the same time. So we can take our we can take our kind of weird crackly sound and turn it into massive kind of distorted textures. Um, the driver's kind of helping here. We could also say, run it through some delay. Pitch it up. And take the density down. nice tactile noises. Oh, that's why that's getting bad. There we go. So 
So the idea initially was to try and use this with... Um, Hello? Okay, maybe this will work. Hello? Okay, good. It's actually got a built-in... Um, I forgot this has got a built-in microphone, so you can kind of talk into it. Hello? Hello? Let's record a bit of this and then see what happens if we layer that, that with the weird, weird crackly sounds. It's not going to use a Maybe it doesn't like me. Ah, there we go. So yeah, with samplers like this, you can kind of be really experimental. It's a really nice way of approaching kind of sound processing in a way that's really like physical. So you can kind of mess around with it. Still coming through super quiet though. I don't have any gain boosters, do I? Damn it. Next time, <laughs> I'll remember one. Um, but yeah, it's, an, it's kind of a, a nice tactical way of like tactile way of playing with sound. And being able to kind of, yeah, get all these little odd textures and things out of it. Um, I'm just going to try and just try and boost the level of this a little bit. That's, yeah, not really worked. Just made it sound really nuts. More screaming? Yeah. Cool. We can do more screaming. That's always fun. Cool. So for that, I'm just running this into a distortion. There we go. And then have a mess around with some of the some of the mods. See what happens. So we've got yeah, speed control and pitch control. Um, you can move use the kind of start point and the size to move around this little window of recorded audio. Yeah, so we've turned that down, but we could also bring it back in. Still going. We've got kind of pretty mad. Mad noise performance going on. Okay, so we'll take some of the resonance down. Where's our, where's our tempo? Bring it down a bit. We'll take this down so it's So at the same time, you can have something, you know, quite pretty going on. And then also something really weird. And because it's all very tactile, it's all kind of physically there, you can kind of get to everything fairly quickly, which is what makes, you know, modular very good for live performance and also really good for things like sound design and doing things in the studio because you can kind of get in there quite quickly and go, okay, well, this is fun, but I want maybe, I want some longer notes. I want a bit more high frequencies. I want some more 
some more modulation on this parameter. Let's you know, just stick a cable into here and see what happens. I want more chaos. Sounds like ducks. And that's, I think, just the voice part. Yeah, there's there's a lot you can do with it. Um, yeah. What time are we on, by the way? Just hitting two hours. I think that might be maybe time to call it. But um, but yeah, are there are there any more questions from the chat or anything? Everyone just been listening to us making horrible noise for the last week. Cool. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's um... I hope so. <laughs> it helps. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's cool. But yeah, um... See, so yeah, I guess like final... Final points, and then also I guess... You guys here, if you want to hang out and just mess around for, you know, a bit longer, then that's... Well, that's, that's all good. Um, but yeah, good resources to check out. Um, there is um, VCV Rack, I mentioned earlier, the kind of free software um, modular environment. Uh, I think they're on their second version now, which is really good. Um, but yeah, it's fantastic. Well worth checking that out and nice to kind of get familiar with uh, patching and the kind of concept of, you know, individual modules performing individual functions and how you connect them up in order to make something a bit bigger. Uh, there's also, you know, if you're interested in making your own modular system, there is a really good website called Modular Grid, uh, where they've uh, every single module that's available is listed. Um, so you can, you know, tell it how big a case that you're thinking of making, uh, and then you just click and drag modules into it. It will tell you how much power it consumes, um, and it's also a really good way of finding out kind of what's out there. If you're like, I want a filter, but I only want it to be 10 HP big wide or whatever, then you can go, right, filters less than 10 HP, and it will just show you all of the ones that are, are, are being made. Um, there is, um, if it's the kind of, if it's the synthesis side of it you're interested in, the um, there's actually a really good uh, synthesis section on the Ableton website, which has loads of very nicely designed kind of UI stuff, um, which allows you to kind of, which kind of teaches you about things like amplitude filtering um, and the kind of fundamental components that go into kind of synthesizing sound. What else is there? There's one more. There's always one more. The shop, my sh my shop, <laughs> Elevator Sound. That's good. Um, you can always give us an email if you have any questions about things or any ideas or things you want to do. Um, oh my God, what was the other one? Oh, Learning Modular. So there's a guy, uh, Chris Mayer, who's been teaching this stuff for years. Uh, he's got a really, really good website called Learning Modular, uh, where there's like a, I think there's like loads and loads of free information. He's also written a book called Patch and Tweak, which is kind of like the Bible for Eurorack stuff, uh, which goes into like all the different types of module, what they can be used for, what sort of things they output. Um, it is, it's, it's like 60 quid, but it's like a, it's like a solid, solid book and it has everything you need in it. Um, I think that's it. I mean, yeah, there's there's also, there's so many amazing performers out there doing kind of stuff with modular. There's meetups all over the place. You know, there's a little kind of scene in every town and everything. I mean, you're all from London, so there's tons of stuff happening here. Uh, sadly, no modular shops, which is a shame. But also, Bristol's only like an hour and a half away on the train, so it works out. But yeah, um, yeah, there's loads of interesting stuff happening up here. Um, I know there used to be a night called CV Freaks. I don't know if it's still being run, 
um, but that was very good. I know the guys who run ALM recently did like a pop-up shop here and had like a week of performances. So there is kind of loads of interesting stuff going on. Um, but I think that's it for kind of wider resources, really. Um, if I think about anything else, I'll put it in the YouTube comments. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think we'll call it there. I think we're good. Which one? Where is it? Hello. Everybody say, everyone wave goodbye. Bye. <laughs> like, like and subscribe. <laughs> that's what they say, right? Cool. Are we good? Thank you.